is great. Um, I'm Ken O'Connor, I'm the policy director for the League of American Bicyclists. Uh, welcome to this session on coalitions for bikes and the climate. Uh, we have a great panel here today uh, that you'll, you'll hear from. Um, I'm joined by Ann Vestikoff from the Environmental Law and Policy Center, uh, Catherine Garcia from the Sierra Club, and Rachel Holtine from Bicycle Colorado. Um, so we're going to start with a short couple of slides from Ann, and then we're going to get into a discussion uh, about the work they're doing for bikes and the climate together. You're in. Where does it go? Pull it up. And it really is a short couple of slides because we decided we would be better off having a conversation than PowerPoint presentations. Then I said that since our subject was climate, I would do a couple of slides on climate. And there's some cool music going on. Yeah, we'll Someone's bag is making music. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. <laughs> Let's get back on music for a panel discussion. It, it's our walk on music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, really, this is just a few slides just to kind of give us a context for bike coalitions and climate. Um, this, within the past week or so, the IPC6 uh, assessment report, the synthesis came out and I really just pulled some points from that to kind of show that I think what we all in this room will acknowledge, there's no doubters here, um, that we really urgently need to take action on climate. It is impacting everything that we care about. Um, I don't need to read those to you, but I just wanted to kind of capture the breadth of what climate impacts are. Um, and then that sort of brings us to at least what we're kind of beginning to talk about here is Transportation is 27% of US climate emissions. It is the biggest sector. So together we all have an enormous challenge of addressing those emissions. And that's what biking is part of. Um, and this is just another way of looking at that, where our emissions are coming from. And you know, transportation is the biggest source and it is petroleum driven. So we really need to electrify our transportation but we also just need to walk and bike and make, and use transit and make our communities more accessible and more safe for biking and walking and access to transit. Um, it can't all be about electric vehicles. I know that that's what a lot of people like to talk about when we talk about electrifying transportation, but if everybody has their own private electric vehicle and they all go out in the streets, we're not gonna be going anywhere. We'll not solve any real problems. And then this is just the last slide. Um, because I thought that that was the quote that came out with the IPCC, the assessment report and the synthesis report. And um, we have a lot of work to do and we need to do it fast and successfully. So I will leave it at that. Thank you for that introduction. Um, oh, that's interesting. We're, we're joined by another video participant. We'll figure that out. Uh, so I want to start with just a, a question and I'll start with, with Rachel on that end and we'll come this way. So what is something you're doing right now that advances bikes and the climate together? Awesome. Thank you, Ken. Uh, so my role at Bicycle Colorado is the director of sustainable transportation. So just the fact that my role exists, I think signals the like immediate connection between getting people on bikes and our climate emergency. So in Colorado, we're, uh, if you haven't heard it yet at the summit or before the summit, we are really leading the nation in our investments in e-bikes, starting with Denver Captors program, providing e-bike rebates for low and moderate income qualifying residents as well as uh, other residents of, of Denver. We've now scaled that up. And this year we actually have $10 million statewide rolling out from last year's legislator legislation. Uh, tomorrow, our governor is actually announcing, get ready for this, e-bike rebates for all Coloradans between seven and eight hundred dollars for the next 10 years oh. yeah so um, yeah it's exciting and I, I say that because what we're talking about right now is the biggest growing movement in Bicycle Colorado's 30-year history and what we're seeing is this really explosive and measurable displacement of cars on the road with e-bikes. So I'm just gonna say, I'm pretty excited about e-bikes as a really uh, exciting way to get people on bikes, but it's like measurable climate mitigation that's helping our state, our country and our planet reach its goals around greenhouse gas emissions. So we're leading with the e-bike in Colorado. 
Um, and we'll just go down the line. So to, to Catherine, same question. Uh, what is something you're doing right now to advance bikes and climate together? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, it's great to be here. I'm Catherine Garcia. I am the director of Sierra Club's Clean Transportation for All campaign. And that really involves all modes of transportation. We're involved in everything from bike policy to electric vehicle policies. Of course, that includes e-bikes. And we're excited to endorse the e-bike act. Um, but that also involves things like land use and even aviation emissions. And so it's very, very, very broad. And I'm uh, very proud to work with an extensive team. Um, we are, we're made up of everything from attorneys to communication leads to organizers. And um, that's spread across. Um, every state in the country, uh, we have 64 chapters altogether. So um, the, the work is very vast. And given the slides we just saw that Anne put up, it's very urgent. The need to reduce emissions and transportation is extremely, extremely time sensitive. So one thing that we're doing um, is um, we're putting together a land use survey and our volunteers actually led this project about 20 years ago and we're doing a refresh. And what it involves is really looking at um, how communities are designed. What we say is um, thoughtful urban planning is essential for thriving communities. And this particular land use survey is gonna include examples in all 50 states um, and profile different um, leading examples and also examples that could use improvement on access to mobility, transit oriented development and affordable housing. Um, but I just wanted to point out one example from this survey, um, it actually profiles the loop in Dallas. And this is an exciting project that's gonna include 50 miles of trails. So just really, really cool to, you know, sometimes you, you think of the examples in California and Massachusetts, but um, we're particularly proud that this survey is going to have examples from all 50 states. So I'll leave it there. That's awesome. Um, and, and finally, same question to you, Anne. Uh, what is one thing you're doing for bikes and climate? One together? thing. Well, I modeled good behavior and I biked here today. Um, <laughs> if I mean, the, I could be really brief and plug my colleague Lena Reynolds' uh, blog on e-bikes in the Midwest and actually looked at how modeling uh, Colorado's program and how that could have an impact in Chicago. Um, but more, maybe a little bit more indirectly, I'll circle around on something that is uh, something we're doing today. My Environmental Law Policy Center, we're filing comments with EPA on their soot pollution standards, particulate matter standards, uh, national ambient air quality standards, and EPA has done a really bad job in strengthening those standards. So pollution is really an uh, environmental justice issue, but it's also an issue for bikers. If you're out biking and air quality is bad, that's not good for anybody. Um, so I would, uh, we're urging EPA to strengthen those standards when they issue a final, stand, uh, final rule for that and urge everybody to take an opportunity. You can find a take action on the ELPC's website or other places as well. Today is the last day to tell EPA to do better uh, for air quality, but also stronger soot standards, but ultimately for areas that have soot pollution problems or non-attainment with the new standard would have to come up with plans to reduce that pollution, which then could help with electrification plans, with active transportation plans, with other ways that cities and states would have to reduce uh, fine particle pollution, which comes from buses and trucks and, and other any other sorts of burning fossil fuels. So important rule today. Awesome. Um, I wanted to ask a question for Rachel. So why why is the climate important for biking? Like we, I think as bike advocates, we probably get why biking helps the climate, but why is the climate important for biking? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I'm not going to just talk about e-bikes today, I promise. But uh, so Bicycle Covered has been around for 30 years. And what we really recognize is our first wave of advocacy was really fueled by and principally benefited a, a class of cyclists that was doing long range cycling for you know recreational purposes. And so we really focused on improving safety for those cyclists. That movement you know, initiated where we are today. And, and the second movement that, I'm gonna ignore mountain bikes for a second, bless you mountain bikes, but um, the second movement was really around, okay, people already are riding bikes and how are we encouraging those people who are already riding their bikes to ride their bikes to everyday destinations like work, school, shopping, local businesses. What's happening right now is that 
the climate emergency is really asking people to rethink their lifestyles and the choices that they're making. And what that is doing is that is getting people who would normally choose to purchase a car or take a car to a destination, you know, within like three to eight miles of their house, they're actually looking at the bike as the solution to that. And so what we're seeing is this just tremendous tsunami of, of people who don't identify as bike riders who are riding bikes as transportation in our transportation system. And that is really being driven by climate concern at the personal behavior level. What's really exciting in Colorado is that at the state policy level, we have our leaders got their heads together and said, we have a climate emergency and created a roadmap to reduce greenhouse gas emissions measurably starting in 2025 through 2050. So we actually have a really rigorous policy framework that is making our Department of Transportation prioritize how it's spending its transportation dollars to not contribute to that terrible uh, graph that we saw from Ann, but rather reduce greenhouse gas emissions through transportation. And it's creating this need for prioritizing investments in non-vehicular solutions, such as riding a bike, riding e-bikes, walking and taking transit. And weirdly, I spent a lot of time talking about land use too. Bicycle Colorado historically has not spent a lot of time in land use and transit. So the climate's actually really driving this conversation, both at the personal behavior level, but also from policy decisions and the conversations that are being, you know, taking place at the federal, state, and local level. So it's a really exciting time and, and climate's creating those opportunities. We just really need to make sure as, as individual advocates, as advocate organizations at the state and the federal level and national level, that we're harnessing this movement to translate into meaningful investments in improving safety on our streets, investing in our connected networks, but also really looking holistically at the system to make sure that e-bikes have safe storage and charging, that you know, we're recognizing a lot of people on e-bikes are maybe people who aren't traditionally bike riders and they may not ride with the same confidence as we typically see on the streets. But right now, bikes are part of the transportation system and the climate movement's really fueling that. So um, sad that that's the reason that we're having so much success right now, but we're making sure we're harnessing it. Yeah, thanks for that. And I think you kind of talking about uh, how people are coming from climate motivations and coming into land use conversations that you weren't having as an organization before. I, I think the league traditionally has not been that involved with environmental organizations as people might think we might might have been. Um, so can I ask uh, Catherine and Anne, uh, kind of, you know, what coalitions are you working in? What should bike organizations look to in terms of like, where can we plug in? Um, I yeah, I can start. Um, what, what coalitions am I in? I'm in DC, so a lot of them. Um, no, but I also work on a lot of issues. So I'm in a lot of coalitions for a lot of different issues. But um, maybe the question is why coalitions exist. And that's because we have power when we're collected together. Um, there's a lot of different organizations say uh, we have a clean vehicles coalition. Catherine and I and Sierra Club and ELPC are in that coalition. That coalition does focus on uh, light duty vehicle, you know, greenhouse gas and fuel economy standards for vehicles. We also work on heavy duty vehicles together and standards for those. Um, there's an electric school bus coalition um, that ELPC is in, that Catherine's in as well. So actually we overlap at a lot of vehicle related and, and transportation related coalitions. Um, there's, you know, there's also a coalition, a charge coalition, which brings together our groups and uh, some uh, electric vehicle industry groups and some bike groups, uh, electric bike groups, and others together to focus on a set of agreed upon principles relating to medium and heavy duty electrification, school buses, transit, charging networks, to ensure that those are accessible, but also include micro mobility and charging opportunities for biking or scooters. Um, you know, so so there are, and, and I, you know, and I think about all these different coalitions because that's not even the, all of them. Um, I think that the issue is there's so much going on. What do coalitions do to share information, to bring people together so that when there are opportunities to take action, uh, opportunities to leverage support for something, there's that the structure is there to do that. And I think coalitions help do that. And I think there's an, you know, maybe a need to look at intentionality about how are coalitions formed, who's in those, who's invited into those, or how information is shared out so that, um, you know, people who you say the bike league wasn't necessarily, isn't necessarily engaged with environmental groups, but with climate, like we know we have to do everything. 
and we have to deal with the transportation sector and biking is a part of that and climate action is a part of that and the environment is a part of that. So how do we sort of look at all the different coalitions that are out there and maybe do more information sharing um, and making sure that people who want to plug into a coalition can, uh, even if they haven't traditionally been in that climate space, because uh, there's certainly room for everybody to yeah, be part awesome. of those conversations. And all those vehicles make me think of how we can make vehicles safer while we electrify them. Um, yeah. Catherine, so kind of that. building on that, you know, yeah. Anne was saying that there's a lot of overlap. There is a lot of overlap, particularly when it comes to regulations on um, um, reducing vehicle emissions and updating traditional vehicle emission standards. Um, but what's exciting is there was a, a particular coalition that brought together the folks in the transportation space um, that are working on electric vehicles and then charging infrastructure and then also active mobility. And the, the key point of that coalition was around the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which is going to really be a game changer for um, new transportation projects um, at the federal level. And this was a new cohort for us. And actually that's how I got connected with People for Bikes. And through People for Bikes, you know, building on those conversations, we heard that there was gonna be an introduction of the E-Bike Act. And I got very excited because this is something that we had been involved with at the local level, but not necessarily at the federal level. So I kind of poured through all of my notes from working out in California at the state level. I connected with folks that were working on um, e-bike incentives at the state level, and I connected with the, the federal folks and passed along names so that we would build a, a larger cohort, a lot larger group of endorsers um, at the point where that bill was introduced. So that's something I'm particularly proud of, and I can tell you our chapters are just so excited to get involved with um, advocating for the e-bike act. That's something that we're really, really excited about, and you know, something I've been um, passing along to my colleagues at, at the Sierra Club, that that's going to be one of the bills that we um, we push for tomorrow during the Congressional Lobby Day. Um, so just a little bit more about CHARGE. Uh, we actually produced a report that was announced in uh, or published, I should say, in January um, with recommendations for active transportation and includes information about making sure there's charging infrastructure for e-bikes. Um, and then also, since we have that money um, from the investment from the um, from the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, and then also um, a number of other recommendations. So it's, I, I wanted to plug that report and we'll have it in the in the links for you after this session. Um, that that coalition itself, I, I know that Anne mentioned it, but it includes environmental organizations like the League and Conservation Voters, Sierra Club, and then New Urban. Mobility Alliance and, and People for Bikes. Um, shifting gears, I also wanted to um, kind of plug a coalition that's out in Idaho. This is, it's called the Canal Connect Community Coalition. And it's a very exciting project because they, are, they want to turn, um, they, in their um, community master plan, they got um, hundreds of miles dedicated for new infrastructure projects. Um, and that's a coalition that brings together the League of Conservation Voters that's local to, um, to Idaho, the Boise Bicycle Project, and Sierra Club Idaho, among other groups. And so this is the kind of thing that, you know, the, their vision is to make sure that there's safe infrastructure for biking and walking. And they came together and got this community um, plan together and passed and, and they're working together to move that forward. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. It's a, a really cool coalition to hear about. I know Jimmy Halliburton, former executive director of Boise Bicycle Project, is at uh, the National Bike Summit, and he had to step down because he got elected to city council, um, which is a great way to <laughs> have to step down from your bike at Super. Um, can one of you talk a little bit more about Charge and how people might be able to get involved in it? Is it something that is more suited for a national group or a local group, or are there things that local groups can plug into? A good question. Yeah, I think I think it's a little bit more suited for national groups because it's um, it's it's really working on the implementation of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, but I know that there's 
I don't think it's that's just kind of the way that it's been presented, um, but I'm sure they'd be open to more local groups, particularly because a lot of this implementation has to happen at the local level, the state level. So I think it makes sense. It's just um, we need to be doing a better job of expanding that. And, and yeah. What, I would, I would say people can you know, take a look at the chart. There's a website and the report is there. And if you feel like it's something that meshes with what your organization is doing, it's not open to individuals. It really is you know, for organizations who are engaged either at federal, but I think also you know, taking the, the infrastructure investment jobs out and making sure that that does get implemented in ways that best advance climate and active transportation, biking and walking and access to transit. There's a lot of money out there now and a lot of that money could go to bad things like widening highways um and or new highways um and you know it's going to take a lot it's going to take everybody making sure that that money goes in the right directions otherwise we'll make the climate crisis worse and not you know achieve the goals that we all share so i would take a look at the charge coalition and if you have an organization you think fits uh, certainly opportunities to you know ask about joining um so rachel you kind of touched on Colorado having a greenhouse gas reduction goal and strategy. Um, and that sounds like a really big thing that probably wasn't only Bicycle Colorado. Was there a coalition you worked with there? And, and what did that kind of look like? Yeah, so um, what Ken's referencing and I mentioned earlier is that in 2022, Colorado ad adopted what's called, we call it the greenhouse gas rule. It's got a much longer name because it's a piece of legislature and a rulemaking process. but. Um, it, it actually creates like a mandate for our state transportation um, department to actually like spend money specific way to meet certain goals. And it makes it much harder for them to spend the money on highway expansions and really like forces both our DOT and our MPOs to really like restructure their, their priorities and their projects. Um, so, so that happened last year, but really the precursor from it was a couple years earlier when our governor created this roadmap that all agencies are working together to try and address greenhouse gas um, uh, emissions. And so as part of that, when that roadmap happened, all of a sudden these environmental organizations, some of them are national with local chapters like Sierra Club, um, and then other like statewide or regional like Southwestern energy efficiency, COPER, Conservation Colorado. These are environmental organizations that all of a sudden scrambled and started adding transportation staff members to work on this. So by the time Bicycle Colorado actually hired my position, there was an engaged coalition that I affectionately call Kill BMT, the Kill BMT, because the whole purpose of it is to, to do policy actions to reduce investments that ex expand vehicle miles traveled and in, in fact, try to contract it. So that coalition uh, came together, it's pretty strong. There's about 20 different organizations that are participants in about, I'd say eight of us that meet every Tuesday. And while we were doing the rule setting for the greenhouse gas rule, and we were like, release the policy wonks. And we were like up in its grill, like with measuring this and accountability here. And we, and it was such a, amazing coalition that was like really action oriented because our state was setting this very important rule that was going to translate to specific investments and projects in our communities for decades moving forward. Once that got passed, we actually kind of had a moment. It's like after you train for a, you know, a century ride or a marathon and the next day you're like, well, now, now what do I do with myself? Um, and so we, we kind of are regrouping right now and, and really now focusing on the IGA and, um, the, the Inflation Reduction Act funding opportunities. And I like to, I, I call it the running turtle, turtle syndrome. Like we all think of turtles as these like sluggish creatures. But when, when those dudes have a reason to run, they're actually really fast. And all the money in the system right now is creating a running turtle syndrome where like these traditionally sluggish bureaucracies that have like legacy methodology of doing things, they're like just doing that faster when we're really pressing up against the urgency of like our climate emergency. So, so we're really trying to like throw as many cogs, you know, like blockade those running turtles so that we can institutionalize the intent of our greenhouse gas rule to actually translate to bike lines, networks, crossings, um, you know, transit land use. So it's, it's an interesting, like this is a really tense year because the rule was set and there, you know, every, 
the IJ seemed like it was going to be around for a long time when it got adopted in December 2021, and now it feels like the clock is ticking on it. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to find that balance between making sure that our communities of all sizes across the state can actually leverage those funds in meaningful ways. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we're doing as a coalition in this shifting from the rule making coalition. Um, so it's, it's an environmental coalition. And one of the things we recognize is political winds can change. And if that happens in Colorado, the greenhouse gas rule is probably one of the first things to go. Um, there is a huge perception that this is like disadvantaging our rural communities. And so there's a whole narrative around the impact of it that is, you know, pretty much uh, pretty contentious. So one of the things that I'm doing right now in part with this coalition of environmental organizations is we're now trying to really reach out and work with our EJ partners to add equity frameworks into this so that so that a equity frameworks are in transportation which they should be regardless of what's going on with our planet on fire um, because our people are on fire and and we need to do that anyway but we're really working to make sure that like the winds from the greenhouse gas rule are actually in close alignment with our other goals around equity and safety so we're just trying to pile the frameworks on so as a coalition we're kind of we're, we're pivoting and and it's great because we do we all have a, a lot of like Venn diagram of EJ work. However, the the thing that comes into that space that I'm always really mindful to speak of is like environmental coalitions work with a lot of urgency and rightfully so. Every every week we get news, whether it's in our backyards or you know across the planet, that like adds to that sense of urgency. But when we shift into EJ work, that's a space of slowing down. And that's a space of, of listening and really like trying to um, open up spaces and like get rid of the urgency. And so I just speak to it because it's a very different space. And so the, this coalition shifting and evolving is, is kind of creating a whole life of its own where we're really having to address that and realize what we use very effectively with urgency to impact some pretty big state policies. We, we now need to, to shift gears a little bit in terms of how we operate. And it's, it, I'm not gonna lie, it creates a lot of tension, um, but it is also the world we're all living in and a skill we all need to learn. Um, so we're, we're trying to learn how to go from, from urgency to, to slowing down and listening and finding a pace of slowness that actually brings everyone into the space together, so. Yeah, thanks, thanks for all of that background. On what's made Colorado successful and the challenges that you're facing now. It, it makes me think of other states like Arizona, where Bill's been introduced to uh, outlaw PMT reduction targets, or at the federal level, we had a greenhouse gas rule, then it was rescinded under the next administration. I think it's proposed again, but I don't think it's been finalized again. No. Um, no. So very, very contentious. Um, I, I know we have a bit of time left here, so this might be a little bit early to shift to the positive question that we talked about for the end, but maybe that means we have a little bit of time for another question at the end. So, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now, uh, we're back in this space as bicycle groups and environmental groups. Um, you know, what wild successes maybe have we experienced or what does that look like to you if we are wildly successful? Anyone want to jump in? Um, I can start. Um, so I have a lot to say based on what Rachel just said, um, but pivoting a bit, um, well, including what Rachel just said, you know, I think it's really, really important to be as inclusive as possible in these coalitions. And so I'm really glad what you said about making sure that you're including environmental justice groups as you're working out these frameworks. I think one thing that I'll add to that is, is building trust. And so it's not necessarily that we're just slowing everything down and uh, not recognizing the urgency, but really make being intentional about um, laying a foundation of trust. And um, I know a lot of times it was with busy coalitions, sometimes you'll have a national group kind of swoop in and that's, that's kind of the worst case scenario you can possibly be doing when it comes to building trust. Um, and so making sure that it's, it's local groups that are really 
um, laying a groundwork for working together long term. Um, and just pivoting in terms of looking ahead, um, I think, so I, I personally, I lived in DC um, about, I first lived in DC about seven years ago, and then I moved away to California, and then I moved back. And I really am seeing a lot more progress here in DC in terms of safety. Um, the administration here in the district has prioritized um, um, safe bike lanes, protected bike lanes. And, and just yesterday when I was on the Cherry Blossom um, ride, you know, we, we came up 9th Street and that's a really beautiful protected bike lane. So I, I would hope that five years from now, we're seeing a lot more protected infrastructure. Um, over the weekend, there was a session where um, Girls in Gear talked about the two barriers to picking up biking for, for young girls is cost and safety. And so that, that really resonated for me, you know, thinking about um, programs that either give away bikes to kids or uh, make make bikes cheaper, make e-bikes cheaper. I think that will be really helpful for getting more folks to to get on bikes. Um, but then also making sure that they're they're safe, that people and families are feeling safe having their kids um, out biking. Um, and then the last thing I'll, I'll mention is the U.S. Department of Transportation um, put out a recent factoid recently. Um, that's 52% of trips are under three miles. Um, and that really makes, that makes the case, you know, the takeaway there is that bikes are ideal for replacing car trips and e-bikes, especially in conditions like DC that have a lot of hills, e-bikes are the perfect replacement for car trips as well. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get people to ride bikes. How do you know that they're gonna get e-bikes and replace their cars? <laughs> I don't know this. By looking at e-bike sales. I think the more people see people riding e-bikes, right, they're still kind of new. I think the, you know, if you go back to your question about sort of what a success looks like if we're going back in some number of years, it's that with all the money that came out of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and all the incentives that are in the IR, in the Inflation Reduction Act, but we need to pass the e-bike tax credit because that was not in the in Inflation Reduction Act, that, that we've invested in the systems that do reduce our emissions, that lock in systems of access to transit, safe walking and biking, and that we've used all the money we have to have an infrastructure system that works for climate success and is not constantly making it harder and harder to achieve the goals we need to achieve. So to me, that is maybe what success looks like. But I also think success, I, you know, Catherine mentioned DC is a great place for e-bikes. Like, I mean, I see families now with e-bikes and their kid, they're taking their kids to school on e-bikes. They have rain covers. They have, I see them zipping up the kids in these insulated things on cold days, but that's new. I mean, when my kids were in school, there were no e-bikes. And I mean, not that we wouldn't have biked your kid to school, but I think because in DC, a lot of kids are going to schools that are not like in their neighborhood. Those would have been car trips. Like, I mean, I see people leaving and taking their kids, two, three kids on the back of a bike with, and I've seen it actually my neighbors, I've seen them bike back from school with a kid and grandma in the back. So I know that this works, um, but, but they, you know, th those opportunities are there. And, and as I said, like even coming here, like biking, is my, you know, the more people see people biking and using those bike lanes um, with their briefcases on the back and dressed for work, people are like, oh, wait, I can, I can do that. Like, I should try that. I think it does become, you know, more and more access, but, you know, we do need these incentives because, you know, e-bikes, if you go look at REI, they're pretty, that's a pretty big investment. Um, and then you do have to deal with access to safe locking outside if that's where you are, because you don't want to come out and find that you're new vehicle is is not there anymore um but you know i think success looks like you know using all the money all of us together working in states and in, at your state level at your city level and nationally to make sure that this money that's there does, goes to the right things and that's that's a hard challenge but that's why we need to figure out wh where the co coalitions are where people can be plugging in where people can be learning from each other um because it's not easy like you know i think as, as rachel was saying influencing state DOTs and influencing city governments is not easy. It doesn't happen by one person doing it alone. That's why, you know, coalitions 
do become critical because you do need to bring everybody together, organizations and individuals to figure out how do you, who do you need to influence and how do you influence them and what information has to be shared to, to do it right. I'll share my, so I am just a wild, I'm wildly optimistic person, just <laughs> despite everything. <laughs> and um, I, it was, I actually suggested we ask this question because I think it's important in this space for us to leave space for optimism and to like really recognize that incrementalism can be hard day to day, but over the course of, uh, you know, a decade or two, it can actually make meaningful difference. And we need to remember that in the space a lot. And I, I have a couple of things I'm really visual. And one thing that comes to mind is like, think of like old timey scenes from movies or even maybe some of us, our childhood where you just jumped on your bike, you went somewhere and you threw it on the ground and you did your thing. And then you jumped on your bike, you went somewhere and you threw it on the ground. You did, And there was just that freedom, right? Like, of like that was just, and it's because as humans, like we seek joy in how we like engage in our own lives. Mm -hmm. And I do this work because I believe that riding a bike like fundamentally brings us joy. And if we're wildly successful, you know, with the bike as part of an ecosystem of things that collectively are trying to make a difference in our climate emergency, we're going to have more ambient human background noise because we're going to have fewer cars on the road and the, road, the cars that are on the road are EVs and they tend to be smaller, lighter cars and less dangerous. And so I just really like envision that because we've also been wildly successful and what used to be the Department of Transportation is now the Department of Vibrant Communities. <laughs> uh, and because they're like, they're just, they recognize that all that money is actually like investing in our communities, right? Like we have a whole different framework for how we're thinking about like how agencies like have agency in our lives. And I just like, I just imagine it's like quieter streets and people like just on their bikes because that's just the best way to get there because that's just the future ahead of us. And, and I, I have a couple little like annoying things I say all the time and I'm just gonna pop them in this space. One is this is always a dial we turn, not a switch we flip. And so we just gotta keep turning the dial. Everyone you see on a bike is a solution to our most pressing problems. And we really need to celebrate every person we see. And at the end of the day, like we're, we're more connected when we're not in our cars. And I believe we all desire a connection. And so the climate emergency is an unfortunate opportunity for us to advance that. But um, I do really believe that, that the bike is an indicator species in our communities. If it's working for them, it's working for everyone. And so we got to keep showing up and doing this work. But I, I do actually have a lot of optimism that it's going to look real different in 20 years and, and for the better. So. That is such a lovely vision. Yes. Part of me just wants to end on that. <laughs> yeah. We actually have seven minutes left, and I'm seeing a lot of hands in person. Um, are, are there questions online? There are not. So I, I think I, I want to give space to the people who are here in person to, to ask a question of the panel, and, and we'll start over there. So the infrastructure, if, you know, people don't feel safe on and so we have the interest in place. And so here, um, the question in Colorado, it snows a lot. So you can have great infrastructure, but if people can't ride their bikes because of the snow, do you have a commitment from the, the cities and the DOT to deal with that so that the bike infrastructure will function safely for uh, people to use their e-bikes? Just if you've got that rebate, you're gonna have a lot more people uh, biking, but they're going to get into the street by if there's not adequate snow uh, treatment. Yeah, well, I'm going to just say something inappropriate. With global warming, we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> I'm just um, so, so yeah, so this problem is not not new, and and I think again with the surge of people like adopting e-bikes, like they there are just going to be more bikes on the road, and so it really becomes from the local to the state level, like incumbent on our elected, I'm, I'm an elected official in my community. I serve on our city council and like we serve our people. And if I'm seeing more and more people on bikes, then it's really important for our elected officials to know that those people need to make sure that their facilities, whether it's multi-use trail on street bike facility or the road itself needs to be snow managed appropriately. Um, but then we need to look holistically at our programs and we're doing bike programs for low and moderate income 
residents, like how are we making sure if it's a like, you know, multi-climate environment that like that program is also providing them with winter tires and like winter gear so that like gear isn't the thing that's keeping them from using their bike as transportation. Mm -hmm. And just a quick little data point from Colorado, 5% of Colorado households do not have a car and 15% of Colorado households with two or more people only have one vehicle. Mm -hmm. Now, some of those are like babies, right? And like, they're not gonna go get their driver's license, but babies need to go places. Um, they have destinations also. And so like, just really like hammering that like bikes are part of the transportation system and your transportation system is plowing for the cars and accommodating the cars. How are we making sure that we're recognizing bikes are part of the transportation system? Is Uh, go here. Um, I think everybody would be remiss if you don't include the fitness aspects of active transportation. Sure. The largest funded activity right now for the CDC is called Active People Healthy Nation. The whole purpose is to get whatever the number they got 47 million people out and moving, either walking or biking or whatever. Um, we were in the session this morning, a lot of the funding that's being generated from the FHA and the CDC requires that the community have a 40% or greater obesity rate. Caroline, you know what your obesity rate is? Uh, not anymore, actually. It's, well, I think it's, it's, well, it's, well, the statewide it, average is less than 20%. Yeah, you're that's one of them. The number one in the country. Oh, okay. I, for, to, to your compliment, okay. go to Mississippi, they're on the other end of the extreme. So the point I'm getting to is that's a big chunk of people. That's a big chunk of money. There's a lot of support for it. If you're in Denver in May, I'm leaving the session with the uh, Fort Collins biking community uh, and, and how it relates to physical activity. And so the whole shift is not so much on climate action, but as it relates to physical activity. Okay. I, can I ask you a question? Yes, I was actually going to ask you to ask me a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I already so, asked him a question. No, um, to that, to the point, about how this is how the priority here is, is one of the priorities is health. Um, I, I was doing some reading on the bike leagues spark community spark grants. Um, and how, how are those funded? Those are funded by General Motors. Oh dear. <laughs> I thought I when I was doing some reading about that, I thought that there was um there was some funding there from the um so I thought there was some funding from the CDC. Active People Healthy Nation funds us for our project on data.bikeleague.org and technical assistance, um, which does include our bicycle friendly community and is kind of that spark grant thing. But the funding specifically for those spark grants comes from General Motors um, and their uh, hopes to improve the planet. Um, but I was going to ask you, uh, in, in the one minute that we have left, uh, what can I do better as, as a bike advocate who admittedly has not engaged in many climate uh, coalitions? Um, what can I do better? I, you know, I would say that you know, there should be a good conversation about looking at what are the different, like, say, climate coalitions in D.C. The, of the national or regional groups, ELPC is a Midwest regional group, so it's not all national groups. Um, where would you where could you plug in and bring more of that what's going on on climate to bike league and to the work it's doing um, and vice versa because you know and we, you know as, as as Catherine noted that through the charge coalition the opportunity to learn about the introduction of the e-bike uh, tax credit and and join and sponsoring that you know there's there's just so much going on and then the question is how do we share information and how do coalitions cross pollinate so I would say we should you know figure out where where does where does the bike league could the bike league fit into one of those climate oriented coalitions? Well, we're saying climate coalitions, but they're all sort of covering different kinds of things and there's more climate coalitions than we've even talked about. So 
but but I think there's a chance to do that and and see where where would there be overlapping interests and opportunities to share information and work together. Yeah, I'm I'm very intrigued by the vehicle uh, coalitions that you brought up. Uh, safer vehicles is, is a huge thing that's important to me. So hopefully there there's a win win there. Yeah, and I'll also just add. Um, there's a, a major piece, there major regulation that Maryland is looking at, and um, there's several health organizations, equity organizations, environmental organizations, and also um, um, a coalition called um, Safe. I think it's Safer Trucks Coalition, um, and they're trying to make sure that the trucks on the road are safer for pedestrians and bicyclists. And so that's that's a natural um, overlap with with environmental organizations. Okay. Awesome. Um, so we are unfortunately at time. Um, thank you for the great conversation. Thank you for being part of the National Bike Summit. Um, really excited to continue to talk to you and continue to grow our work together uh, as biking organizations and climate organizations. Thanks, guys.